today? You doing well? It's good to see you all. My name is Pastor Seth. I'm one of the staff pastors here at Vertical Church, and uh, I'm happy and honored to be able to stand up here this morning and share with you about uh, our dream team, our volunteer ministries, and why we serve here at Vertical Church. But before we do that, get there, I just want to take a minute. Can you help me honor our senior pastors, Pastor Ken and Pastor Kathy? They are, um, yeah. We need like one of these cameras up front, so every time we, someone talks about it, we can just put them on the screens, like the kiss cam. On, uh. But they're amazing people. I love them so much. Uh, my wife and I tell people all the time that we have a third set of parents um, because they are just so, such incredible people and um, love that we get to be a part of what God is doing here and the vision that God has given them. And uh, my wife, she's here this morning, and uh, so is our daughter, who's about six months inside of her. <laughs> it's... Uh, We'll get to meet her very soon, which I'm crazy excited about. So uh, nobody mess with my little girl, that's all I'm saying. You got fair warning about three months early, so look out. That's what's up. That's, that's her bodyguard in case any of you want to. Um, I'm also honored to be up here this morning because um, I'm teaching about serving, but uh, it's Memorial Day weekend. And um, I spent uh, nine years in the Army, so this is not one of those holidays that easily slips my my mind, I think about friends um, that didn't make it home and friends that, that made it home but never actually made it home, if, if you understand what I'm saying. And um, so Ronald Reagan said this, the president, he said, uh, I don't have to tell you how fragile this precious gift of freedom is. Every time we hear, watch, or read the news, we are reminded that liberty is a rare commodity in this world. So I just want to um, just take a moment and say, you know, whatever you're doing this weekend, this afternoon, tomorrow with your families, remember why we have this uh, day off from work. We have it to honor those who have laid down their lives so that we can sit in a building like this. Um, so that our freedoms are secured and we can, we can serve our God and not have to be afraid. Um, of what, what may happen to us. So uh, I just wanted to, to give, some, give a nod to, to Memorial Day there. Um, but today we're going to talk about serving. And I, I titled this teaching, I Was Made for This. And uh, if, you, if you have your Bibles with you, go ahead and turn to um, John chapter 13. We're going we're gonna to read through um, a couple verses there this morning. And one of my tasks here at Vertical Church is that I get to oversee our, our dream team. And I know last week, um, Pastor Randall said he had the best job in the world, but um, he lied to you. <laughs> We're working with him on it, I don't know. But uh, I actually have the best job in the world because I get to work with um, the amazing volunteers that make this place run this morning every weekend. Everything that you see happening here on a Sunday or Wednesday is because we have the most amazing volunteers in the world that come and give their time and their life um, for what we do here. Yep. They deserve that. They sure do and a lot more. Just I want to give you a couple statistics. We have about 1,100 adults that come through here on a, on a every weekend on Sundays. Uh, that's not in including kids or youth. That's just the adults. And we average between 100 and 150 um, people that serve on our dream team. Um, and many of them you never see. You don't ever encounter them. Uh, they're behind the scenes making, making things work. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that later. But um, there's act an actual study that was done, I believe it was by the Leadership Network, and, and they said that it's actually harder for a larger church to get volunteers. And the reason why kind of kind of shocked me. It's not, it's not what you would think it was. Usually you'd think it was because people just don't want to serve. <laughs> but um, the, the case is actually that um, because in a larger church, there are more physical entrances to the building in this, the auditorium, and there are more service times. So when people come, and our, most of our dream teams are, are built off of a, a scheduled basis, so they rotate even the positions they're in. So when you come, you see different people. Even if you come in the same door, you see different people on a weekly basis. So your mind actually tells you that there's plenty of people serving here. So um, we're giving people the benefit of the doubt and not, saying not that it's a greedy thing, that you don't want to serve, but because your mind is playing tricks on you. 
<laughs> and telling you that we've got enough people, but I'm gonna tell you that we, we will never have enough people to reach uh, everyone in this world for Jesus Christ. Um, so what I'm not gonna do this morning is stand up here and guilt trip you. I'm not gonna stand up here and tell you why you should serve. I'm not gonna t- stand up here and tell you all the numbers and why we need people in certain areas. What I'm gonna tell you this morning, I'm gonna help us see is that we were made to serve others. I want you to say that. Say, I was made to serve others. I was made to serve others. And if you're taking notes, that's your first fill in the blank. I was made to serve others, okay? Now what I wanna do is I wanna read through um, John chapter 13, verses one through 17. And I wanna read, th- I wanna read through that because I want us to understand the contact, context in which this story that we're gonna take from is happening. I think a lot of times we'll take a scripture and, it, and because we don't understand the context, we can make it mean what we want it to mean. And that's not its intended purpose. So just follow along, I'll read, you can follow along. They'll have it on the screens as well. We'll start uh, John chapter 13, verse one. Before the Passover festival, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Some translations say completely or totally. He loved them totally. Now by the time of supper, the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas, Simon Scariot's son, to betray him. Jesus knew that the Father had given everything into his hands and that he had come from God and that he was going back to God. So he got up from supper, laid aside his robe, took a towel and tied it around himself. Next, he poured water into a basin and he began to wash his disciples' feet and to dry them with the towels that he had tied around him. He came to Simon Peter who asked him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered him, what I am doing, you do not understand now, but afterwards you will know. You will never wash my feet, ever, Peter exclaimed. Jesus replied, if I don't wash you, you will have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, then not only my feet, but my hands and my head. (laughs) The one who has bathed, Jesus told him, doesn't need to wash anything except his feet, but he is completely clean. You are clean but not all of you, for he knew who would betray him. This is why he said, you are not all clean. Verse 12, when Jesus had washed their feet and put back on his robe, he reclined once again and said to them, do you know what I have done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and this is well said, for I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done for you. Verse 16, I assure you, a slave is not greater than his master and a messenger is not greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. So we're gonna kind of take this scripture apart because there's so much, there is so much within the context of the scripture that is, is powerful to, to service to us serving others. Um, and I, I wanna talk first about a cultural, um, something cultural that, that, that we need to deal with, and that's the foot washing, okay? Because in our culture here in America, foot washing doesn't really mean anything to us. There's no real significance to us. I mean, some of us may have it done when, when we go get a, a mani-pedi, um, they wash your feet or the little fish eat the nastiness off your feet. But, um, but, but in reality, foot washing, the way Jesus is talking about it, doesn't really mean anything to us. And, and I, I kind of had that same impression. You know, some people are like, ooh, feet are nasty. Oh, I don't want to touch feet. That's disgusting. Oh, they're smelly. Oh, they look like talons, snossages, whatever. Like, oh, I don't want to touch feet. And, and I kind of had that same, same thought process, like my feet are my feet, your feet are your feet, we're good to go. Let's, let's just set that boundary here now. Um, and then I went to, I traveled with Pastor Ken a couple years ago, we went to India. 
And in our travels, we had a kind of an itinerary of different villages we were going to that the missionary that we were traveling with um, had a relationship with, and there were churches planted there. And we were doing, uh, Pastor was teaching, Pastor Ken was teaching at some, some Sunday morning church services, and then at, at one place they were dedicating a new building that they had built, which was really exciting. Um, so this one day, I don't remember exactly when it was, we had, we had a couple villages scheduled to travel to, and in, it was hot in India. That ain't no joke when people say that, it's hot in India. Okay, um, like 100 degrees, hot. So we went to, the first village we went to that day was, um, it was in what they called the jungle. So, so we went out to the jungle and, um, and so we, we visited at this village, just spent a couple hours out there. Pastor Ken uh, shared some, some uh, shared a word and we ate lunch and we just had a great time, but it was hot and we were sweaty and, you know, we're wearing uh, khakis and a button up or a polo shirt and nice shoes with socks and um, because, you know, of the, the event that we were going to. But, um, y- you know, the way I pack is, and this, I blame this on nine years of being in the military, is I pack like one, one outfit per day, right? Because I'm not carrying all that stuff. One outfit per day. So, so here's the problem when you pack one outfit per day, per day. It's when it's really hot in India and you go to a village and spend the day, you get wet, sweaty and nasty. Okay, so we had some time in between our next village, which we were going for dinner. So we went back to the hotel, you know, I, t- I put some shorts on or whatever. I let those bad boys air out, hung them out the window a little bit, turned the fan on. And then we got ready to go. I put that same outfit back on and we went to the next village because it was still hot. So, you know, what's the point in, in sweating up another set of clothes? So needless to say, the, the socks on my feet were not clean. Let's just be real here. I'm sorry, hon. I know. I'm going to get a good talking to on the way home. Socks were not clean. So we get to this village and, you know, we're walking up and we sit down. They always had such a great way of honoring you when you got to these villages. Each one was a little different. It was unique to see. And um, so we sit down in this, these chairs. They had them lined up in front. There were probably six, five or six of us. And um, they, we see this kind of line of women and children and they come by and they put this, this flower thing on you. And, and it, it was great. It's great. But then these women came with, where they had basins and jugs of water and towels. And so we kind of like looked at our, you know, the missionary and our interpreter and they're like, oh, they're gonna wash our feet. And you're like, oh dear Lord, (laughs) these poor women, (laughs) they don't have any idea what they're about to get into. She like, and we're like, okay, let, let's, we'll, we'll spare, we'll spare them the expense. Uh, And so you start to take your shoes off and they're like, no, 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 they'll, they'll do it for you. start praying in tongues and asking for a miracle to, for new socks or I don't know what was going to happen, but you're like, okay, so there's a line of women and the first one comes and she takes your shoes off and she pulls your socks off. Poor thing. <laughs> oh, man, I wouldn't want to take those socks off and I had to. Um, and then the second one comes and she has a basin and she's the one who actually washed your feet. Now, now when I say she washed your feet, I mean she washed your feet. She didn't pour water over it and move on. She washed your feet with her hands without gloves on or a mask or goggles or nothing. She, no splashback protection, nothing. Like, I don't know what was in my feet from that whole day of, you know, I don't know what was happening there, but they were not pretty. They were not pretty, but they washed her and then she moved on to the next one. And then another woman came with a towel and she dried your feet completely, dried, dried your feet. And then she moved on to the next one. There was another woman who came and she had this beautiful smelling stuff that she rubbed all over your feet. And I was like, you know, listen, this is your party, nothing for nothing, but the lady with the smelly stuff should go first because <laughs> that'll save the second one from having to deal with, you know, the nasty socks. Um, but as they were doing it, they were singing a song. The whole village was singing a song. And I said to the translator that was with us, um, and I said, what are they singing? And he said, they're singing a song. The words that they're saying are how blessed they are to wash the feet of the ones who bring the gospel. Like a baby, just. (laughs) So here I am concerned about my stinky feet and all they're concerned about is honoring us by washing our feet. And so I never really understood 
the, the reality, the concept of, of foot washing until that moment, until that moment. And it gave me this whole new perspective on what it meant because it, it wasn't necessarily the thing. It was what it meant to them. See, it had meaning to them. It was real to them. By them washing our feet, it was their way of, of saying, we honor you. We know that God sent you from a far place and we honor you. And had I said, you know what, my feet are ripe. You don't wanna, I'm out, I'm good. I would have been dishonoring them by not allowing them to do that. So I tell you this story because I want you to understand what we just read. And in the times that Jesus lived, the context was that feet washing was a normal thing because they wore sandals and they lived in the desert. So their feet got dirty. So the ritual or the, the, the standard was every time you came in the house for the evening meal, your feet were washed, okay? Now here's how it was set up. Either there was a basin with water and you would, you would wash your own feet or the host would have a servant there that would wash your feet for you, okay? Here's the thing that never happened. The host never washed feet, never. You either washed your own or he had somebody wash them for you, but he never washed your feet, okay? So I want you to think about that. We're gonna tear the scripture apart a little bit because now they're sitting having dinner, right? So they had already come into the house and it's clear that their feet had not been washed yet. So Jesus is sitting in a room with 12 guys who had seen him turn, turn, turn a, a boy's lunch into this meal that fed masses, who had seen him walk on water, raise people from the dead. These guys had seen that. They lived with Jesus. They were part of his crew. They walked with him every day. They knew that he was about to go and be betrayed and be murdered. Jesus knew that. If there was ever a moment, ever an evening where these 12 guys should have been serving their master, it was tonight. But they all decided to sit around a table with dirty feet. So you ever been to a restaurant with some, a group of people and, um, you know, the meal's over and the bill comes out and she just lays it on the, or he just lays it on the table and says, whenever you guys are ready. And everyone's just kind of, you keep the conversation going, but you're kind of looking at it. <laughs> you're going through your mind, okay, I paid, I paid uh, three times ago, then uh, he paid. So if you divide that by 12 and multiply it by, and we're just waiting to see who's going to pick up the bill, right? And then someone inevitably goes to the bathroom and drops their wallet in the toilet, right? So we have to understand that Jesus is a master architect when it comes to crafting these learning moments for us, okay? So we can, we can make the assumption, I think it's a safe assumption to make that Jesus was the host of this evening, right? We read through the passage so we know that all of the materials needed to wash feet were there right? But there was no servant to wash feet. So Jesus has put this thing on the table and he's like, okay, nobody did it when we came in. Let's just see who picks up this bill. Let's see who's about to wash feet. So this is what Jesus does in the middle of the meal. He gets up and he goes like this. Excuse me, guys. And he takes his, it says he takes his outer garment off. And then he picks up a towel. Now, scripture doesn't tell us that he went in a back room and found the hole that he had dug earlier that night and hid the towel in it. It says he picks up the towel. That means it was there and he wraps it around himself. Now, I want you to notice that still nobody gets up. It's gotta be fairly obvious at this point what Jesus is about to do. They all know foot washing is a common thing. They all know what it looks like. Still, nobody gets up. So Jesus goes, okay. Okay. And he walks over to the table. And he kneels down in front of his disciples. 
and he takes their sandals off. And still nobody gets up. Still nobody gets up to say, you know what? You shouldn't be doing that. So Jesus gets a pitcher of water and he begins to wash the feet. He begins to wash the feet of his disciples, making sure that they're clean. And he pours this water over them foot by foot. And then he takes the towel and he takes that foot he just washed and he dries it. And still nobody gets up. Twelve guys with two feet apiece. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> I don't see any biblical context that, that, that some of them didn't have two feet. So he goes disciple by disciple and he takes their feet. They're probably smelly. They've been out all day. They're probably very dirty. Paul's are not, by the way. Paul's are very clean. Thank you. <laughs> I'll buy you a coffee later. And still nobody gets up. Person to person to person and nobody gets up. I want to introduce you to Paul. Paul is a servant among servants. This man will drop anything that he's doing when I call or text him, whatever I need, and he will make it happen. He leads our outreach team here at Vertical, and he, that's right. And he exemplifies what it means to serve. But Jesus came around that table and he washed each and every disciple's feet and at not one moment did any of them stand up. We don't even have an account that any of them said anything to Jesus. Until we got to Peter. Thank you, Paul. And then Peter, just how Peter is, like you're not touching my feet, you're not washing my feet. You shouldn't do it. You shouldn't be washing my feet. But he still didn't offer to finish. Right? And Jesus says, if I don't wash your feet, you have nothing to do with me. And he says, all right, great. Wash it all. Where's the shower at? Let's get this thing going. Jesus said, I don't need to wash all of you. I just need to wash your feet. Jesus got all the way around that table with the towel. See, he picked up this towel and this towel became his weapon. This towel became his tool. And he was making a point. And we're going to look at this. So in verses uh, 13 through 15, it says this. You call me teacher and Lord, and this is well said, for I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash the feet, also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done for you. See, verses 13 through 15 are, they formulate um, a, legal, a, a legal statement, okay? And if you're a lawyer in here and I say this word wrong, just, just forgive me. It's called a, a fortiori is the legal statement, okay? And what that statement holds in it is that you make the most powerful argument at the beginning, then everything else that follows is based off of that argument. Now we, naturally, we don't necessarily like to do that. We like to build up our little blocks first and build it and build it and build it and then boom, give them the big one. Like what are you gonna do now about it? So this statement, your Lord and teacher, which I am, is a legal, is a legal term, it's a legal phrase. And he made his most powerful statement right at the beginning. So anything that followed, there was no arguing because I am, right? We get down to verse 15 
And there's one word that I want to look at. I'm sorry. Um, verse uh, 14. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. The word ought in the original text, the Greek word, holds within it not a physical requirement, but a moral requirement. I'll say that one again. The word ought in the original text holds within it not a physical requirement to do as Jesus did, but a moral requirement. So Jesus wasn't saying, I want you to walk, physically wash everyone's feet that you see. He was saying, I want you to look and hear what foot washing is in our culture and bring yourself to that level and serve everybody that you encounter. See, foot washing was not something that was glorious. Can you imagine if you were that servant? Hey, Bob, uh, we got some guests. Bring out the bucket. Oh, more feet. Watch more feet again. I hate feet. Can you imagine being that guy? It's a lowly position. Lowly. So Jesus is saying to us, I want you to humble yourself to a position that's lower than you think you should be and serve whatever happens above that. See, verse 17 says, I've given you an example. You are blessed if you do that. And James 1.22 says, don't be hearers of the word only, but be doers unless you deceive yourself. Well, I've heard that before. Well, good. Are you doing it? So we have to know that we are created in the image and likeness of Christ. We see that at the very beginning of time. God said, let's make man in our image. So that means that the same passion, the same desire that drove Jesus to kneel down and wash the feet of his disciples is built into who you are. See, our human selfishness will say, well, I want to be served. I don't want to serve. But who you were made to be says, I want to serve with everything I am. Number two in your notes, serving like Jesus is the only way I will be truly fulfilled in my life. I want to get to one of the big issues in the story. They came into this house for dinner and nobody, nobody washed anybody else's feet, but nobody even washed their own feet. So I said, that's, that's interesting because it was the standard of the time. That was the culture was to wash feet. So what was this about? We see uh, throughout the gospels and throughout Luke that the disciples prior to this event and even on this night had been arguing and they've been arguing about who was going to be the, the top dog. And we were arguing about who was going to sit next to Jesus. And we were arguing about who was the right man, who was the right hand man. That's me. No, I am. Oh, no, I am. So they walked into this house, and who knows, maybe the basin was there by the door. And they all went, oh, I'm not washing my feet. Because that'll put me below him. And I don't want to do that. Because I want to be with Jesus. I'm going to be the man. Every disciple walked in that house and said, I'm not washing. Matter of fact, I'm not even ducking down low enough to wash my own feet. None of them, even as Jesus started washing feet, none of them were willing to put themselves in that position to humble themselves to serve other people. See, the disciples in this moment were fighting over a throne but they weren't willing to fight over a towel. And Jesus was telling them that the towel is greater than the throne. You want the throne, pick up the towel. See, a throne denotes uh, notoriety. People know who you are. I'm gonna ask this question, I'm gonna ask a general question because I don't really know much about sports so I, I wouldn't know the answer to them anyways. Your favorite sports teams, can you name them? Who's the star player on that sports team? Can you name him? 
Who's the newest guy that that sports team just hired? Can you name him? Good. Now name the towel boy, the water boy, and the bat boy. Come on. Can't do it, can you? Can't do it, can you? Do you see my point? You see my point? Are you fighting over a towel or are you fighting over a throne? Which one is more important to you? Because Jesus said, I have the throne. Jesus was in a power position. Scripture tells us that God had given him everything. He was the man. He said, I have the throne, but I want the towel. I'm going. I love when she talks to me. Your third fill in the blank. Am I fighting for a throne or for a towel? Am I fighting for a throne or for a towel? See, there are many thrones in our culture today. But I guarantee you there are many more towels just laying on the ground. Somebody just, ooh, I don't, I'm not doing that. I can't do that. We have to be willing to pick up the towel. Jesus did it. So why is serving on the dream team, our volunteer uh, team, so important? Why does it matter? Who cares? It's what we tell our dream team members. You serve so that other people can meet Jesus. Well, that should have been a lot louder. That was bad. You serve so that other people can meet Jesus. See, it's a sacrifice to serve. It's a sacrifice to serve. So what? The guys on our parking team, the guys in children's church, the, the people in children's church, people all over this building that don't actually get to be a part this morning of what's happening in here. They're serving somewhere so all of you can be in here. Somebody in this room needs to hear Jesus this morning. And if there was nobody to watch their child, they couldn't be in here. You see what I'm saying? He said, well, there's, no, there's nowhere for me to serve here. We have a children's ministry. Within that children's ministry, there's teachers, there's assistant teachers, there's assistant to the assistant teachers, there's craft workers, there's worship uh, leaders, there's people at the children's check-in, there's tour guides. We have our creative media team, the audio guys. These are guys you never see. You probably wouldn't know them if I put a name tag on them and paraded them across the stage. They'd probably get tackled by the security team. So audio guys, the people who make these screens work, our video operators, our directors, the assistant directors, our lighting crew, the duplication team that creates the CDs and the videos, our first impressions team, those are the guys you see when you walk in the building at the doors and help you find your seat and give you a worship guide, our parking team. Those guys are out there, rain, snow, sun, shine, tornado, hurricane, typhoon, uh, tidal wave, whatever you put on them, those guys are out there in the parking lot. We have people that help serve our communion. We have our security team who helps keep people safe. We have people who work with the youth in the back, our worship team, the vocalists, the musicians, the choir. A cleaning crew. Listen, I, I had to learn this myself. This building don't clean itself. (laughs) <laughs> people show up here on Saturday morning at like five in the morning and clean this building. It's ridiculous, but they do it. We have our outreach team. We have our small group leaders. They're part of our dream team. They help fulfill the purpose. We have, people, we, we have opportunities in our cafe. Who doesn't like coffee and, and, and cupcakes or whatever they, golly. Man, right? Sweet treats. Give me some of them. We have our bookstore. We have a, a dream team called Meals for Moms that when, when, um, when uh, women have their babies, which we're about to use, uh, have their babies, <laughs> that's right, they get free meals. That's what's up because you don't want daddy cooking because we're having cereal for dinner. We have a ministry called Caring Hearts that they are just so compassionate and loving that they love on people who have just lost somebody in their lives. Listen, you will never be fully satisfied in your life until you're doing what God created you to do. I didn't tell this story at first service, but I'm gonna tell now. Pastor Frank and I, when I first was, was figuring out the call of God in my life, we were out to lunch and I was just getting involved in youth ministry. Uh, I promise we were, it's a true story. <laughs> we were at Subway and, uh, 
And um, um, a, a good friend, somebody who we both knew, we both grew up in, he's moved on, he's in another church now, serving as a pastor there. He came into Subway, and we we're sitting eating, and he stopped by and he said, hey, uh, good to see you. We talked for a few minutes. Then he went back and got in line. And as we're continuing our conversation about me getting involved with youth ministry, he, he comes back to the table and he says, Seth, I just need to tell you something. And I was like, oh, all right, let's have it. And he said, I don't know, I don't know, take it for what it's worth, but, but whatever, wherever you're in in your life, He's like, you need to know that you'll never be fully satisfied until you're doing what God has called you to do. And then he turned around and walked away. <laughs> oh, <laughs> what am I supposed to be doing? We have this thing built into us where we need to be, we need to feel like we're touching lives, we're reaching people, and that's what our dream team is about. He said, well, well Pastor Seth, um, uh, I don't think that I'm, I'm, um, I'm created to help people find seats. No, I don't think you are either. But I think God gave you a cheery disposition where you love to talk to people and be around people. And guess what? We have an area of ministry that you can get involved in. So I don't think God intended me to park cars. Well, we tell our parking lot attendants that they're not out there to park cars. They do it, but they're not out there to park cars. You say, I believe there's something inside of you that God created you where you just love to wave at people and smile and you enjoy being outside. Great, we got a place for you to plug in. <laughs> see, all of our dream teams, we tell them this. If you see a need, you meet the need. I don't care where you're serving. I don't care if you're working in the, in the youth center on a Sunday morning. If you're coming through the, the, the concourse and you see somebody with a need, meet the need. That's what we're created for. That's what we're made to do. So I want you to kind of look around this place. And I want you to say, where, where can I get involved? What towel is laying that I can pick up? And think about this. Let's just use these numbers as, because I'm no good at math, so I would embarrass myself. If we have 100 people that serve every Sunday morning, and we have 1,100 adults that come here every Sunday morning, and every single person was involved with serving other people, how many Sundays out of the year would you have to give up? Mm, that's the right math answer. Not many. It's my kind of math right there. It's true though, right? Can you imagine what this place would look like if everybody was so focused on serving others instead of ourselves? So, well, I'm coming to church for me. Listen, when you serve others, you are serving God. And when you serve God, he will honor that. He will absolutely honor that in your life. We have to know that's what we were made for. That's what we were created for. Uh, John Bunyan said this, you have not lived today until you have done something for someone who can never repay you. Charles Dickens, no one is useless in this world who lightens the burdens of another. John Holmes said, there is no exercise better for the heart than reaching down and lifting people up. So I ask you today, what is your place? Where do you see yourself? You say, I don't know, I don't know. There's, listen, there's so many, I didn't, that wasn't an all-inclusive list. There's, I, I, in between services I was adding stuff, there's probably so many more that I've, I've completely forgot about. We've got a system built that helps you find those places where you can plug in, Dream Team 401, it's this afternoon. Go. You don't have to be signed up for it. Just go. Pastor Frank will be in there. Just listen. He loves more people, the better. You're welcome. <laughs> I'm going home. Just kidding. <laughs> go. Stop in and meet some of the leaders and find out where you can plug in. Because I'm telling you, I'm telling you, when you begin to serve other people, you will find a fulfillment that you cannot find anywhere else. Let's pray. God, we come to you and, oh man, we're just so thankful for who you are. We're thankful that you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to come to this earth and to teach us, to show us how we're supposed to live. Father God, I pray that we become more focused on the towel than on the throne, 
that we begin to see ourselves through your eyes, that we begin to see that we were made to serve others, and that when we do that, our lives will just, will just come together in ways they never have before. Father, I pray that you open each of our eyes, that we may come to know you, that we may come to see you, that we may come to see others the way you see them. And Father, the desire to serve others becomes so wild inside of us that we can't contain it. Father, in that as we serve others, more people meet you. And as more people meet you, they begin serving others. And as they serve others, more people meet you. God, we thank you for